So, we are members of the church in Ephesus gathered for worship. We hear Paul's letter read to us. We hear that God has given each of us every spiritual blessing, adopted each of us as his child, showered his grace on each of us, redeemed us all. Every last one of us. For we are all one church. But if that is so, what difference does it make for a Christian home? Well, Paul explains this as he presents his Christian household code in Ephesians 5 and 6. And we cannot understand Paul's household code unless we know how households in Ephesus operated. Because a text without a context is often a pretext for a proof text. Now, let me repeat that. That a text without a context is often just a pretext for a proof text. And if ever there was a passage to illustrate that, it's Paul's household code in Ephesians. So how did homes in Ephesus work? Who was in charge? Without question, the senior male was in charge, and the convention was that he should rule his slaves like a tyrant, rule his children like a king, and rule his wife. For as Josephus declared, she was inferior to her husband in all things. So, that's clear then. The senior male rules. Everyone in the home is subject, note that, subject to him. But Paul has a different model for Christians. He begins with a bombshell. Be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. But what exactly does that mean? Well, Paul gives three illustrations. How does being subject to one another work out for husbands and wives, parents and children, slave masters and slaves? And what he shows is that if we are not subject subject to one another, we cannot be all one church. First then, husbands and wives. Paul begins with what everybody held as self-evident. Wives, be subject to your husbands. Okay, so far, so good. He then goes on, Husbands, love your wives. Okay, fair enough, I suppose. But then comes the thunderclap. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And how exactly has Christ loved the church? Christ loved the church through serving rather than being served, modeling what self-sacrifice looks like. So, husbands, love your wives like that. A husband's love for his wife should be self-sacrificing. And make no mistake, in this society of Ephesus, when push came to shove, it would be the wife who would sacrifice herself for her husband. For a husband to sacrifice himself for his wife would be demeaning. Yet, Paul says, the role model for a Christian couple is Christ himself. Therefore, 
be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. Be willing to sacrifice for each other, for we are all one church. Now, if the church in Ephesus puts this into practice, imagine what the neighbours will be saying about that Christian couple three doors down the road. I've never seen anything like it. I'm not sure who wears the trousers in that house. And then Paul addresses the children. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Well, there's nothing unusual there because most people would accept the general truth that children should obey their mums and dads. However, household codes from the first century addressed the male head of the home. He's in charge, remember. These codes did not address children, but Paul addresses them directly. Why? Because church is their home as much as anyone else. And Christ died for them, redeemed them, overcame the powers of darkness for them. And when Paul addresses the children, he speaks to all the children. That is to free children and to slave children. You are all children in the family of Jesus, the Messiah. What difference might that make to slave children, for example? Well, let me give you just one example. The use of slave children for the sexual gratification of their masters was the norm. And slave children who had suffered that abuse were probably present as they heard Paul addressing them and their fathers. That is, fathers and their biological children and also the slave children now under their care. Slave children often didn't know who their biological parents were. And Paul tells those fathers to bring them up, those slave children, he says, in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. The same Lord who said, whoever welcomes a child in my name welcomes me. Those children are now members of the household of God in Ephesus, to violate such a child would be to violate Christ himself. For we are all one church. And then Paul turns to Christian slave masters who had slaves in their household. In the first century, about 20% of Christian believers were slaves. 20%. How does Paul speak to them? Well, he doesn't seem to start well. He says, slaves, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling. So, you slaves... Know your place and be terrified of what your master will do to you if you don't, right? Well, actually, no. These words, fear and trembling, are a figure of speech, meaning to show appropriate respect. Uh, for example, Paul tells the believers at Corinth that he visited them in fear and much trembling. Paul wasn't terrified of the church members, but he showed them respect. But Paul now goes a step further. 
he addresses slaves directly as full members of the body of Christ. Not only that, but Paul tells slave masters that they and their slaves, he says, have the same master in heaven, and with him, there's no partiality. Both slaves and their masters are equally accountable to God, and therefore, whether they do good or evil, Paul says, they will receive the same again from the Lord, whether they are slaves or free. So we can see Paul beginning, well, beginning to undermine the institution of slavery by emphasizing that God is no respecter of persons. Therefore, neither should a Christian household, because we are all one church. But... Why doesn't Paul go further in his household code about husbands and wives, parents and children, slave owners and slaves? Why doesn't Paul write a feminist manifesto? Why doesn't he present an impassioned proposal for the abolition of slavery? Because if we wrote this letter to Ephesus, we certainly would, right? Well, the reason Paul doesn't tell the world what it should do is because he has a more revolutionary project. Instead of wishing that the world was different, he calls on the church to be different. Start where you are and see what happens when you apply the gospel to your home. Why does Paul begin with the home? Because life in Ephesus centered on the home. People in cities like Ephesus worked at home. They didn't commute to the office. They weren't on the assembly line in the factory. They weren't employed in the pizza restaurant on the other side of town. Almost all were working at home. So what Paul says about the home affects society as a whole because society was centered on the home and Christians also worshipped in somebody's home. Paul isn't avoiding society by dealing with the home. He's trying to transform the most important element in society. Now, he does the same thing in several letters that he writes. I have time for just one example. In the year AD 62, Paul was in prison, and he wrote at least three letters, probably within weeks of them, each other. Colossians, Ephesians, and Philemon. And in all three letters, he addresses slavery, if I take that as an example. In Colossians, he simply says, slaves, obey your earthly masters, and masters, treat your slaves fairly. That's Colossians. In Ephesians, he repeats that, but he pushes it further. He adds that both masters and slaves have the same master in heaven. And that master shows no partiality. Slave owners and slaves are on the same level. So Ephesians goes further than Colossians. And then, having written Colossians and then Ephesians, Paul goes further than he does in Ephesians when he writes to Philemon. Philemon is a Christian slave owner. 
he owned a slave called Onesimus. Onesimus had run away, he'd met Paul and had become a Christian, and he had helped Paul while Paul was in prison. And Paul was now sending Onesimus back to Philemon, asking him not to punish his runaway slave. And he hints, he nudges Philemon to free Onesimus. Philemon, he says, should welcome Onesimus back, as Paul says, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother. Welcome him as you would welcome me. I am writing to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. Hint, hint. Now, this went against everything in that society. People would say, look, if you free this runaway slave, they'll all be at it. Yet, Paul asks Philemon to see Onesimus as a fellow Christian, just like Paul. Someone Christ died for and equal in the sight of God. Because we are all one church. Now, of course, Paul's household code does not overturn all the troubling social conventions of his time. Some remain that make us uncomfortable. But let's give Paul credit for what he does do. The purpose of Paul's household code is not to keep the status quo. His aim is not to keep people in their place. Rather, it is to put Christ in his place as supreme example and radical mentor. Paul begins the momentum about slavery, for example. As we move from Colossians to Ephesians to Philemon, we can see Paul's direction of travel. So, dear believer in Christ, see that kind of movement. Get sight of that revolutionary trajectory and pray that we might be as courageous as Paul was and like him ask how might our homes question our society's conventions for the sake of the gospel and show that we are all truly one church. Thank you.